Today's Bible readings. The first one is from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. And the second reading is from 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 to 13. Love. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. This morning I've taken the liberty of following, of not following the set scripture or the lectionary for today. Instead we're to reflect on Paul's so-called hymn to love, which we've just heard. In a way it's appropriate to Mother's Day for it ends with faith, hope and love. These three, but the greatest of them is love. Many of you will have been at a wedding where it was read. Perhaps you included the reading at your own wedding. Or you may have been to a funeral where it was read. The other day I was in the bank when suddenly the mobile phone of the man began being served began to ring. And of course phones take priority. So he answered and he was soon talking in a loud agitated voice. He was shouting down the other person. I didn't know whether to pretend I couldn't hear or whether to listen to this one-sided conversation in the hope of understanding some terrible thing that was going on. I felt embarrassed and intrigued at the same time. And you would have had that sort of experience. But that helps us to understand Paul's so-called letters to the church at Corinth or his hymn of love as it is sometimes called. It's actually, in a sense, Paul responding quite often to a letter that we haven't got. 
and we have to surmise what was going on in Corinth from what Paul is talking about. In the 1st and 2nd Corinthians, which comprise 28 chapters, scholars now believe, believe there's evidence of possibly five or six letters, and some would say fragments possibly of ten letters that we've got that someone has put together. The letters are Paul's response to letters or reports of happenings and, or troubles in Corinth. As we said, it is as though we have one side of a telephone conversation. Paul visited Corinth a number of times. His first visit was probably in the summer of the year 41, about ten years after the time of Jesus. And he stayed there for 18 months or so before moving on to Antioch. There he kept in touch with the Christians by writing to them, sometimes replying to questions they have asked of him in their letters. In fact, the first Corinthians, Paul begins by responding to a letter he's received. We don't have that letter and can only surmise what was contained in it. There were no written Gospels yet, the first, as you know, was Mark's and about Mark at, at about uh, at year, the year 64. But they had developed various gatherings of the Jesus movement with their stories and experiences of Jesus. There were lots of different groups had some experience of Jesus and some, and they sort of gathered around and that part of their knowledge was what kept them going. But they were quite different in a way. But uh, they had in effect, or they were in effect, developing an, an oral tradition. Corinth was a seaport of a population of about a quarter of a million, with all the hustle and bustle of trade and the immortali Im immortality, immorality. <laughs> and it made me think, somebody wondered how Dorothy was getting on, and I saw they're giving her small doses of mortine. <laughs> I should have, anyway. <laughs> Corinth was a new and lively city which was rebuilt by Julius Caesar as a Roman colony in 44 BC. It flourished and in 27 BC the Caesar, now Augustus, declared Corinth the capital of the Roman province of Greece. Paul believes that he is called to be the missionary, the evangelist, to the Gentiles, not to the Jews. And on his first visit, he has headed off bushy-tailed and eager. Paul was probably unprepared for what confronted him in Corinth, but he soon came to love the Jesus followers there and called them, or they were the called-out ones or the ecclesia. But he was shocked by what he encountered in Corinth. Over the years, Paul makes a number of visits and over the years when not there, he continues to keep in touch with them by his letters. There were many religions practiced in this Hellenistic city. Religion was popular, or certain religions were. There were many different cults. The Egyptian god Isis, or Isis and Osiris, was very popular. But the most widespread was the cult of the emperor, the Roman religion. Augustus himself saw himself not only a secular leader, but also having divine authority as well. He had declared himself God, Son of God, Saviour. Somewhat like the current leader of the North Korean country. Paul came saying, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. The society in Corinth was hierarchical. Everyone had his or her place from slave to emperor. By contrast, reminds them in his letters that in the church there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. All those walls had to go. These man-made walls between people had to go. Class war was alive and well in the church, even when they met for the Lord's Supper. 
there were problems between Jews and Greeks. Corinth had a synagogue, but many Jews were not fully committed and were known as the God-fearers. There were those who were called to challenge Paul's, or came to challenge Paul's authority and his teachings. And in the second Corinthians, Paul receives a letter which is so nasty, so confronting, so aggressively rejecting his teachings and authority that he's brought to tears. Can you imagine Paul weeping? Well, he did. You can sense Paul's anger and hurt as he counters their criticisms. Mainly their criticisms were that they had said that they disagreed with Paul who said about the resurrection, if Christ be not risen, we are most of all to be pitied. There was also tension in Corinth when some Jewish Christians argued that everyone had to follow the law of the Jewish Bible. The young church obviously raises a host of issues with Paul in their various letters and Paul attempts to guide them. Some of the points of conflict were eating meat which had been offered to idols, issues of sexual morality, using the courts to settle disputes, speaking in tongues in a noisy, screeching babble, and greedy behaviour at special meals. He, in effect, calls them babies, little children who have not developed, and he is disappointed that they have not grown up in their faith as he had expected. Paul rebukes them. He believes that it's time they started to grow up in the faith. He was attempting to establish a radical new faith, offering liberation from fatalism, from cosmic despair, the terror of mystical cults. Paul is endeavouring to plant a new faith with an ability to create a moral community where none had really existed before and to encourage the elevation of active charity, of love, above all other virtues. Paul says, when I was a child, etc. Dr. Hamley used to encourage us to explore whether Paul is talking about little children or the young in the faith. Even when Jesus says, suffer the little children to come unto me, he is probably or likely talking about the young in the faith. Recent converts those who have become Christians in a dangerous and hostile environment and need special care and support. Anyway, here in Corinth is rebuking them because they seem not to have grown in their faith. Two weeks or so ago, I joined a group at Modbury when the leader suddenly asked us, how has your faith changed and matured over the past 20 years or so? in response to our 21st century knowledge of the universe and science and ecology of hunger and homelessness and so on. Were we defending a 19th or 20th century faith or were we open to new understandings and new expressions? We have a faith once delivered to the saints but every generation must reinterpret it in the light of their knowledge and so on. Increasingly in our complex, seemingly falling apart world, we need to deepen our concern for social justice. It's pleasing to note that you have a group, I think, whose task it is to inform you about social justice. We shouldn't leave it to the Synod or such rare luminaries as the Reverend Eleni Polis, who recently returned to her studies. We should become known as a church that above all is passionate and compassionate about social justice. I suspect that is the way to attract today's young, intelligent people. As you know, crucifixion was designed to deny, destroy both body and identity. It was Rome's most horrifying and humiliating form of capital punishment. It was regarded as so shameful that even victims' families would not speak of it. 
Paul turns up to break the silence about the shame and fear of crucifixion instilled. Instead, Paul turns defeat into victory, declaring in effect, in the cross of Christ I glory. A shameful event has become a triumphant one. Paul's view of the cross of Christ were different for the Corinthians to act difficult for them to accept or understand and eventually with those who openly challenged him. It is rather like present day issues such as domestic abuse where countless women have suffered in silence. To break the silence whenever violence is used to shame or instill fear can be life-giving as Rosie Batty has been demonstrating sexual abuse by certain clergy, the uh, effect that has been, the silence of that has been broken, appalling domestic violence, the silence on disabilities and so on, all of those have been broken and we're now talking about them and that's the beginning of doing things significant. Paul has some things to tell the strong and the weak. We've tended to think that Paul is talking about those of a strong faith as opposed to those of a weak faith. But Paul uses the term to refer to social status. The strong were those of higher status who could afford to buy meat in the market, who could throw their money around, living selfishly and extravagantly. They might send out dinner invitations held in a sacred precinct of some goddess People of lower status would not be included. There was even a split about status lines in the church over the Lord's Supper or fellowship meals. The haves would turn up first, well before the laborers and the so-called have-nots. The feast may involve a formal part of the bread and the wine, but by then many of the rich were getting drunk, and as Paul says, the poor were going hungry. It was considered natural that guests occupy places around the room according to their relative status. The less important in the eyes of the host, the smaller and poorer the meal. Despite all this, however, it is remarkable how Paul, over the years, was able to initiate a remarkable transformation, how he established communities, the church, living out the gospel in many places that grew and grew and grew. He is the great architect of the lived out way of Jesus. There are, of course, attitudes which he held which we would be want to contest. Oh, it's interesting that women should be silent in church. You're laughing at him. <laughs> Apparently, some scholars say, ah, oh, that's not Paul. Somebody has put it in, as they had a, they were wont to do. They would, others who read it would add in a little other sentence. And there are many, when they look at some of the early readings, have come to the conclusion that women should be silent in church was at a time when things had changed and that was important, but uh, it's not binding on us. He even told them to cover their heads and they used to wear hats. And then the women had such hats, they said, for goodness sake, stop showing your hats off in the choir. Go on, have a haircut. <laughs> so now we come to what is often called Paul's great poem of love. Having criticised their lack of unity, criticising their using the courts to settle disputes, filling their, the air with their noisy, often unedifying speaking in tongues, with their heads filled with the notion of the mystery cults, their greed and lack of charity, their lack of love, their crass behaviour, their drunkenness and childish behaviour, he declares at the end of chapter 12, I will show you a more excellent way. In effect, I will tell you about love at its best, he goes on. Well, they had three words for love, as you know. Eros, the word for sexual love and desire. Philos, a love of knowledge, philosophy. And then agape, the great self-giving love. 
Some of the, well I shouldn't say the girls, it sounds sexist, but anyway, some of the girls at school would say, oh I love this and I love that. And one girl one day said, oh I love potatoes. Well love is a relationship term, so if she was having a relation with a potato, good luck to her. <laughs> Every sentence in his poem of love is in effect a loving yet firm rebuke to the Christians in Corinth. In a loving way, Paul is telling them off, calling on them to grow up, to act differently, many of whom behaved as though they had no knowledge of agape. But Paul loved them, and so, in a sense, earned the right to criticise them. I think people who are deeply committed to the church have earned the right to be critical of it where it's appropriate. It's those who have no concept, no commitment to the church that we sort of say, well, I think you should go and jump in a lake somewhere. <laughs> so what is it for us? Keep the faith. Keep alive your love of God and one another. Encourage one another. And don't let opportunity pass to do a caring, loving act to another. No matter how small, or an insignificant an act it may seem. It may mean writing someone a letter, or making a cheery phone call. It doesn't have to be about your latest malady. People say, oh, it's my cross and I have to bear it, and they're talking about their influenza. So that's the only cross we bear. Or be, be a slayer of loneliness. It's one of the great maladies. There are lots of people who the only conversation they have is when perhaps they turn up with Meals on Wheels. It doesn't have to be about sickness or moaning and whatever. Be a slayer of loneliness if you've received an act of kindness. Pass it on.